question. Josie, do you have a question? So will the A plot between the exam I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Once we open it, it's like a time thing. Like we really have like. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'll just uh, it'll look like an assignment. Okay. So that um, you know there will be a PDF file there that you can access starting at 12, and then you'll need to upload your solution and supporting details before 12 o'clock on Friday. Go ahead. Will there be any equations given to us on the in-person portion of the exam? Um, hmm. Maybe more significantly, you, you should ask, is there any equations you need to memorize, right? Yeah. There's nothing you need to memorize. You know, for example, so if I wanted to do you to use the green amped equation for something, I'd provide that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love taking off points, but not for like memorizing equations and stuff. But I do really love taking off points. You know, we get a bonus at the end of the year for the number of points we take off. That's how they determine our our big bonus at the end of each year. So <laughs> it's not true. There's no bonuses. All right. Um, So your assignment's due tomorrow at Thursday. I've already mentioned a couple times that that's when the solution will become available. Any other questions related to announcements and course scheduling type stuff? All right. We're going to continue talking about infiltration today, and we're going to get even more narrow in our view and talk more about the soil properties. We kind of uh, approach this by looking at the equations that are used to describe the rate of infiltration, uh, both with the green amped and also with the Horton method. And um, so we're going to talk more about like what are the physical characteristics that kind of explain some of the behavior that we observe. So we'll finish up this chapter seven coverage of infiltration today. Um, now, I've mentioned before that What's unique about clay particles is that they have a very large negative charge owing to the small particle size. Um, clay particles have a, a large surface area relative to their volume. And here in this figure, it's representing clay particles as, um, I guess, uh, little flat planes. And I think that's to, to bring your mind to the concept of you know, rather than being spherical, which maximizes volume per surface area, if it's more flat in shape, then you're going to have relatively high surface area for the volume that's there. And so there's a really strong negative uh, electrostatic charge on the outside of these clay particles. And that's going to be significant for explaining the suction head that we have seen on tables before. And I'll pull up that table of soil properties again in a moment. Um, of course, the other thing is that if we have really small um, soil particles, then the voids themselves are also going to be small. So water passing through clay kind of has two resistance factors that explain the very low hydraulic conductivity. On the one hand, it's having to pass through very small tube. And remember that I've, I've mentioned the idea that uh, the voids in a soil matrix are these interconnected routes that water has to pass through, like a pipe, in a sense. And that this, we already know this from hydraulics, that if you have a really small pipe diameter, there's going to be relatively higher head losses as water passes through that pipe. And so if the void in a soil matrix is the pathway that fluids are passing through, a small diameter or a very constricted path is going to increase the amount of energy required to achieve a certain velocity or for just a certain amount of driving force like ponding at the surface there would be a much lower penetration rate for something where there's small grain diameters but then the other side of that same coin is that you've got the negative charge of the particles themselves and water being attracted to the particles. And so water can't pass through a clay very easily because the voids are small and also 
the water is attracted to the clay and it, it's kind of uh, impeding the free flow of it because of that attraction with the clay. Now, in contrast, sand, which has a larger particle size and larger void sizes, is going to allow for the much um, easier transmission of flow, so the hydraulic conductivity is higher, and the suction head is lower because the ratio of negative charges on the outside of the surface is so much lower relative to the volume. Now, this figure is showing that there's a distribution in grain sizes. And so you'd have one big piece of sand that maybe has a diameter of two millimeters and then a smaller diameter grain could fit in part of the void. So not all of the voids in the sand have the same size. There's a range of different pore sizes where if you had maybe six or eight adjoining large diameter particles, then the voids around them would also be large. If it's surrounded on all sides by another large particle like itself, then there's going to be a big void that water can pass through more easily. But if it's a well-graded soil, then um, there's going to be these really tiny particles filling in some of the spaces. And um, we'll see a diagram of um, the subsurface water content in soil. And uh, there's this transi transition zone where there's a varying increase in the water content. And it's because of this void size distribution. And so when we get to that figure, I'll, I'll remind you of this notion that sometimes there's a big void. Sometimes, look at this one's really small, tiny little space there. And the range of distributions of voids explains why sometimes water is going above the, uh, the water table. Um, above the saturated zone of the water table. So we'll hit that in just a moment. But before we do, uh, I wanted to show you a, a soil texture triangle. This is maybe something that you've seen before already in geotechnical engineering. And uh, soil is a mixture of different components. Um, there, are, there may be a, a gravel constituent that we would exclude from soil, but predominantly soil can be thought of as being comprised of clay, silt and sand and uh, of course clay has the smallest size grains silt is larger and sand is the largest aside from gravel um, in the notes i give you the example of what if we took some a soil sample and we found that in that soil sample it was 25 percent gravel meaning these particles that are larger than two diameters 40% of that sample was sand, 33% silt, and 2% clay. You'll notice on the soil texture triangle that it's a triangle, it, it's not a square. So we wouldn't consider all three of these different components. You exclude the gravel component. There's no gravel aspect to this. And so you would need to recalculate the relative quantities to normalize um, for how much of this sample is sand relative to the quantity that is sand, silt, and clay. So in other words, this column that says recalculated, that is if it was 40% out of 100%, where 25% of it was gravel, then 53% is the recalculated quantity. So in other words, the 53% just comes from 40% divided by 0 0.75 because we exclude the gravel component. So then that's saying 53% of it is the sand out of that which is sand, silt, or clay. Okay, so you can see that the breakdown of what percent it is follows according to um, the numbers, like if it's inclined. And so just starting with the sand. Um, the, uh, the sand, it, no, I guess we're starting with here the, yeah, sand. 53% is sand, so um, the angle of the, the numbers here tells you that you would find the 53% and go at an angle, and we're going to look for a point of intersection. So depending on the, the other quantities, you know, depending on how much silt and how much clay there is, it could potentially be considered a sandy clay, a sandy clay loam, or a sandy loam. Um, now, 
The next one would be the point of intersection with the percentage of silt. So 44% silt, this green line that's just come on. So we've got this point of intersection. And then the third component, it's only going to be 3% clay. So then the yellow line, all three of those come together at the same point. So this would be a sandy loam that has some gravel in it, quite a bit of gravel. 25% of, um, of the soil there is gravel, but a sandy loam interspersed with gravel. So that's kind of how we determine the, the description of the soil. And then once we have that description, let me just jump ahead to this figure. Once we have that description, that's where we can look up some of the properties that would be typical. And so what we just had was a sandy loam. So if we go here to a sandy loam, you could see what a typical porosity would be, a typical effective porosity, and then the wetting front soil suction head, which describes um, how readily the water is drawing the um, like the, the pressure that the water is being drawn, drawn down with. And of course, we use this parameter in the green amped equation. And here's the, the green amped equation where we're trying to find the cumulative infiltration depth that's occurred up to a single point in time. And then for this uh, sandy loam, we could also look up the hydraulic conductivity, which you'd use in both the, the green amp method, but also when we're doing calculations related to the um, Darcy's Law. Okay. Um, but there's a range, and um, you know the, the, that bracket of typical values can also be expressed graphically here. And so you'd see for our sandy loam, uh, what would be a typical field capacity, porosity, wilting point. Now, I don't think we've described what field capacity and wilting point is. Um, these are parameters that talk about how much water is in the soil. And uh, wilting point, for example, is describing um, that quantity of water that's so tightly bound to the soil that plants aren't able to extract it. So that, you know, when a plant dies, there still may be some moisture in the soil if the plant is dying because the conditions are too dry. It's just the plant can't extract 100% of the water from the soil. You know, that last little bit of water that's bound to the soil really tightly uh, has to be baked out and can't just drain by gravity or be drawn out by plants. Um, so the field capacity is what is still in the soil after draining by gravity. So if, if we know that it hasn't rained for a few days, then usually the water content would be somewhere in the range of the field capacity. And remember, the most it can be is the porosity subtracting out those voids that aren't interconnected. So effective porosity would maybe be the upper limit of uh, water content in the soil. And then wilting point, we just talked about already. So this is the range that water varies. It swings back and forth. When it rains, it's going to be closer to having the water content of the porosity. When the water is drained out of the soil for a few days, it's going to be in the range of the field capacity. And if there are plants in the soil that are trying to draw the water out and conditions are really dry, then it may go as low as the wilting point. Um, water moves more easily in sand than clay because of the hydraulic conductivity. But when there is a rainstorm, remember what we saw in the video, that um, water can get into the clay more readily than it can get into the sand, that initial entry, because of the, uh, the soil suction. So on that subject of the, uh, the suction in the unsaturated zone, by the way, unsaturated zone means above the aquifer, above the water table. Beneath the water table, all of the voids are full of moisture. But above that, the uh, moisture content varies. Um, you may remember that in the lab for fluid mechanics, we had a really small diameter tube that we dipped down into water. And when we did, water was drawn up into that glass tube because of the attractive forces that the water has with the glass in the tube. And a similar thing, of course, already also happens in soil 
where when you have that series of interconnected small diameter soil voids, the water is drawn up above the saturated zone. And so if, if we're thinking about this as being kind of a, an analog to what's underground, the, the, um, the aquifer is the water table beneath which all of the voids are full of water. But even above that, the water can be drawn up because of suction through for these small diameter tubes. Um, so there's a, uh, a test that can be run to see what kind of um, suction pressure there is for a different soil type. Uh, when it's dry, typically, um, you could have this tube that's filled with water, and you'll notice that there's a tip at the end that the water can leak out of, and it creates a vacuum. As the water evacuates the tube there, um, there's nothing to, to fill in the space behind it. And so it's uh, forming a vacuum, and that's connected to a gauge, and that's what you measure to try and determine what is kind of the force that the soil ex is exerting on the water to draw it down into the dry soil. And um, you can graph the suction pressure. This is a logarithmic transform of the suction pressure. That's just showing um, on a logarithmic scale so that you could actually graph different soil types. Uh, you know, if it wasn't logarithmic, then the sandy loam and the cl silty clay would be down here on the um, near the horizontal axis, and the only thing we'd see would be the clay. But um, as the saturation increases, the suction tension decreases, and that's why we have that declining potential rate of infiltration. As uh, as the rainstorm goes on and on, you're filling up more of the soil voids. The degree of saturation increases, and then the uh, tension goes lower. So the unsaturated zone is the zone above the aquifer but beneath the ground surface. So uh, there's some moisture in the soil here depending on how long it's been since the last rainstorm, depending on the distribution of the voids, because even though the water table beneath this boundary all of the voids are full, Above this boundary, there's still some moisture there, but it may not be fully saturated. There's some of the voids that are small diameter may still have a lot of moisture in them. Some of the large voids may have drained and now have air in them. Uh, water moves up and down depending on how long it's uh, been since a rainstorm. Exfiltration is the process where soil moisture evaporates into the air. But there's also interflow, which is the sideways movement of water. And um, we'll talk more about um, aquacludes and artesian aquifers and why water sometimes moves from side to side. But um, there's geographic functions that'll do that. Like if, if the, you'll see that the ground is sloping downhill. And so if the ground is sloping downhill, then so will the, the aquifer. And eventually, you'll come to a low point which may be a creek. And even when it's not raining, there's still base flow getting into the creek. There's still groundwater that's seeping sideways and getting to, to fill the creek um, during the times between uh, rainstorms. Um, this is a, a graph that shows how much water um, is in the soil and what would be the pressure head at uh, different degrees of water content. And um, so when the soil is fully saturated, then there's no more suction pressure. But if you drain it down to the field capacity, which remember field capacity is just gravitational drainage without any plants drawing the water out, without baking the soil, just gravity draining, then um, for a certain amount of suction head, you'd see here maybe 340 centimeters of water. but uh, when the plants are drawing the water out of the soil, they can take out water from much smaller diameter voids than just gravitational forces alone. And so you can see that the pressure head goes much, much lower into the suction territory from, from uh, the plants. And then beyond that is just 
oven drying or air drying. You know, if you were to spread out a soil and allow it to have a lot of air circulation, then this water that usually would be unavailable when the soil is beneath the ground surface, just because there's not enough movement of air to cause the evaporation. Um, you can see that the, uh, the suction head varies quite a lot, but it's usually the gravitational water range that we're seeing the variation between saturation and the field capacity uh, from most of the times when there's a storm. So again, this is just a cross-sectional side view of the soil profile and um, the, uh, the pressure that there would be. And as you get down into the groundwater, the pressure is zero. So to the left of this line represents suction. To the right of this line represents positive pressure. So when you're beneath the interface of the uh, unsaturated zone and the saturated zone, uh, when you're above it, the suction head is negative. But when you're beneath it, the pressure increases according to the hydrostatic equation. The, the deeper down you get into the aquifer, of course, the pressure is going up by the unit weight of the soil. Um, the uh, sideways movement of the water, the interflow goes towards a, a creek or a low point. Maybe it would be a pond or a, um, a lake. But infiltration may not happen at the same rate everywhere in an aquifer. Um, there may be some spots where it's, it's only raining over a certain part of the watershed, so there could be more infiltration here, and the water table would be elevated because there's rain here and not rain somewhere else. So that's one force that could cause the water table to be raised differentially. Um, it could be that in part of the watershed, there's like a clay layer that's slowing down infiltration so that the infiltration is fast in the section of the watershed that doesn't have a clay layer and then other portions do. And so then that would cause the water table to be raised in one spot versus another. And then here, it's just a function of the geography. Just the simple fact that if you've got a downward slope of the surface, then there will also be a downward slope of the uh, water table. And then when that happens, there will be lateral movement of the moisture. So how quickly the water is able to infiltrate depends on the soil surface. And if it's been disturbed and compacted by people, then that reduces the rate of infiltration. And that's one of the things that urbanization causes. And we've talked about how you know, ponds are built to mitigate the effects of urbanization. And uh, you know, the effects of it, urbanization are putting in asphalt pavement or putting in roofs. And both of those things will increase the C value and reduce the amount of water getting into the soil because they're impermeable surfaces. But then uh, simply, even if you were just going to, uh, to leave the, the natural vegetation in place, but you compacted it by driving over the soil or walking on the soil, then that would reduce the rate of infiltration as well. And so predicting the, the rate of infiltration through the unsaturated zone is what both the green amped and the Horton methods do, is trying to say, above the water table but beneath the groundwater surface, what does that wetting front look like and how quickly does it penetrate through? And um, it depends on the initial soil moisture because if the initial soil moisture is relatively high, then the suction head would be much, much lower. And um, we, we have other equations that describes how easily the water can move sideways and the, the rate of groundwater flow. And there will be pump equations that we'll look at later in the semester to try and predict um, you know, for a certain hydraulic conductivity, how much water are you able to get out of the subsurface when you've got a pump going and trying to, to lift it out. Um, but going over some of these terms that are on the handout that I gave you uh, a few weeks ago, the zone of saturation is just another word for the aquifer itself. It's where all of the voids are full of water. So the zone of saturation is beneath uh, 
this water table boundary. The zone of aeration is when some of the voids have water, some of the voids have air in them. And you can break that up into different sub areas. Uh, the soil water zone is relatively close to the surface. The capillary zone is very close to the water table. And that's where there is an increase in the water content just because of the capillary effect. And then the intermediate zone is in between. And this differentiates between the capillary zone being close to the water table. And what we'd see is you know, fully saturated voids beneath the water table but then there's going to be a gradual decrease in the water content through the capillary zone because of the distribution of soil void sizes. So this is showing that decrease in moisture content in the capillary zone. So the further away you get from the water table here, the theta sub s is just saying that the water content is fully saturated, meaning that all of the voids are full. But then even above the water table, there's just a gradual tapering of the, um, of the water content because of the suction effect of those voids. And so how you, I mean, even if it's fully saturated above the water table, you maybe would ask, well, then why is this the water table? Why not put the water table line here where you actually start to see some of the voids? And the reason is because we define the water table as where the pressure is zero. I mean, going back to this figure, this figure defined the water table as that location where the pressure was zero, where the, the soil pressure begins to increase according to the hydrostatic equation when you're beneath that boundary. Above it, you have a negative pressure. And so even though in this figure, this is showing that you have fully saturated voids above the water table some distance just because of the capillary effect. And then it's tapering off in this region because some of the voids that are larger in diameter have drained and the smaller diameter voids still have water in them. So this is just due to the, uh, the distribution of voids. And if you have a relatively uniform soil, then this would be pretty flat. If you had a huge variety of soil grains and void sizes, then this would be a pretty long transition from fully saturated down to the initial moisture content. So it's the, uh, the surface tension effects of the water being attracted to the soil that draws the water up above the water table and also draws the water down from the ground surface when there's a pool of water at the surface because of rainfall. So we measure that surface tension by the suction head. And uh, some of the ways that you can quantify it, um, the, the effects of the uh, soil suction head and the rate of infiltration, if we want to go out into the field and do a site assessment of the rate of infiltration, then rather than just waiting for a storm, you can take an infiltrometer, this is a single ring infiltrometer, and you pour in a certain volume of water and you'd measure the initial height of the water and then with a stopwatch, you just kind of keep track of how quickly does that water level decline. And you can see at a certain time the water would have penetrated down a depth, but it's also penetrating sideways. And so this single ring infiltrometer test makes it hard to differentiate between the water that's going down and the water that's going outwards. And so that's why they've developed a double ring infiltrometer. And the advantage of that is that the water in the outer ring is what's responsible for the water that's both going downwards but sidewards as well. And then just measuring the rate of decline in the inner ring is going to tell you really how quickly the water is going downward. And so if you had a rainstorm over a really broad area, then the majority of that area would be just experiencing downward flow. And it's only at the perimeter, at the border between where it's raining and where it's not raining, that the water is moving sideways. And so it's this double ring infiltrometer and the central portion of it that really would give you an idea of uh, 
how the soil behaves when there's pooling at the surface. Yeah? Is it also possible, could you set up tubes to see if, like, what effects, like, the water dispersing out? Mm -hmm. do? Yeah. So. Yeah, you could uh, put in sensors to measure the rate of the moisture increasing. You, uh, if we go back to this figure, you could put the uh, tensionometer, stick one of those down in the soil, and watch how um, how the uh, as the as the water from the infiltrometer went through. How the that maybe changes the suction that you see in the tensionometer. So yeah, th there would be some ways to maybe bump it up a notch rather than just sticking a ruler in the thing and and measuring the rate of it going down. Here is a, uh, a certain volume of soil. <clears throat> and remember, for our purposes, soil is a mixture of solid particles, water around those so solid particles, and then voids. And the voids sometimes have air in them, sometimes they have water in them. And it varies depending on whether it's raining, how long it's been since a storm. But the overall porosity is just how much of that space isn't the solid particles. And uh, typically varies between 25% and 40%. And just as a review, the soil moisture content is the ratio of the water to the overall volume. And it varies from zero up to and including the porosity. And then the delta theta is how much the water content increases as uh, it goes from the initial water content to fully saturated. And so when it's been fully drained by, uh, by gravity to the field capacity, then that remaining water content is the residual moisture content, theta sub r. So effective saturation is just the available moisture relative to the effective porosity. Now, um, we talked about Darcy's law uh, at the beginning of this discussion of the uh, infiltration. Okay, so when I told you about Darcy's law before, I showed you a soil column that was on its side. And the reason I did that is I just think it's easier to visualize of the difference in elevation in the upstream and the downstream reservoir if it's on the side. Um, the more classical representation of Darcy's Law is this figure where, uh, let me explain what we've got. We've got a soil column and it can be vertically inclined or it can be inclined sideways and that actually doesn't matter. You know, if, if the voids are totally full with water, which they are, then the driving force is just going to be the difference in elevation in the upstream tank and the downstream tank. And so you can see here we're measuring H1 and H2. So the total head is just the water elevation in the upstream tank. The total head at 2 is just the water elevation at the uh, downstream tank. And they're making the point that water is always continuously entering both reservoir uh, upstream and continuously leaving the downstream reservoir so that the uh, the head is constant. In other words, the tanks aren't draining and so we have an equilibrium. The, uh, the inflow and the outflow through the sand isn't having the head vary, but the head is constant. So constant water surface elevations. And so here's Darcy's law that says that the flow rate is going to be proportional to the hydraulic conductivity. The cross-sectional area is the area that's perpendicular to the flow direction. And then the driving gradient is the difference in the heads divided by the length of the soil column. So this key parameter that dictates the flow rate, the hydraulic conductivity, is what's physically measured. Um, and it takes into account the two factors we've talked about, the void size and the friction effects of the water having to flow through those voids, and then also the attractive uh, forces between the water and the soil. So sometimes the, uh, the gradient is just abbreviated as J. So if you look at what that gradient is, is it's the difference in the elevations, and so the delta Z 
between the water surface and then divided by the length that the water is flowing through. And sometimes rather than finding the flow rate, it will just describe what's called a flux. So the flow per unit um, unit area of the soil column. So if you took the flow rate and divided it by A, then rather than having the volumetric flow rate, you'd have the flow per unit area. So lowercase q is the flux. Um, so Darcy's flux is just saying that the rate of water moving through the soil is proportional to the hydraulic conductivity and the driving gradient. So the, um, the piezometric head difference divided by the length. All right, so get some practice with Darcy's Law just to uh, dust off the calculator a little bit after a lengthy conceptual lecture. Let's say that we have a fine sand that has a rated hydraulic conductivity of three meters per day. So uh, what flow rate would you expect if you have a, uh, a column that's a meter long and the diameter of that circular tube is 25 centimeters. So with the diameter, of course, you can calculate the cross-sectional area. And then the uh, difference in head is 35 millimeters. So that's just H1 minus H2 is 35 millimeters. So what sort of flow rate, if you had a column of sand, this is something you could go and buy. You could go and buy uh, a pipe that is 25 centimeters in diameter, a meter long, and you could stuff it with sand so how much water would get through there? What would be the flow rate in terms of cubic meters per day if you were trying to drive water through that column of sand? Okay, um, so of course the, the place to start here is by calculating the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So. If it's 0.25 meters, then we get the cross-sectional area, the uh, change in elevation of the water is 0 0.035 meters, and um, so we should be able to get 5.15 liters per day through that soil column when we've got the elevation difference of 35 millimeters. And if you wanted to force more water through there, you'd either have to increase the area shorten the length or increase the driving force and so have a, a greater head difference between the upstream and the downstream on that column of soil. Um, the one last thing I wanted to briefly show you is this figure that shows when it's raining how the um, how the water penetrates through the soil um, initially, at the surface, the water is fully saturated, but then it penetrates downward with a, uh, a curvature here that is similar in shape to the curvature that we see above the water table. And remember, the reason why we have this curved shape is because of the distribution of grain sizes. And so, um, the capillary effect is drawing the water up above the water table in those small diameter voids. And so by the time you get this far away, all of the capillaries that have water in them s still are really small diameter. When you're not quite as far from the water table, then some of the larger diameter voids can have water. And it all depends on the, um, the suction tension associated with that void size, but the similar thing happens with this wetting front where what's going to fill up more quickly is going to be the small diameter voids that have the higher suction tension and are drawing the water down with uh, a greater magnitude than the larger diameter voids. And so um, these different dashed lines just represent different points of time. You know, maybe at the beginning of the storm, one minute later, two minutes later, three minutes later, and so the wetting front penetrates down through the soil and gradually increases. Um, okay, so that's the end of the content that's going to be included in that first midterm exam, which opens up tomorrow at noon uh, for the two computer-based questions. And then in class, 
on Friday is when we're going to do the uh, paper-based calculation. So that's it for today. I will see you on Friday and uh, just give me a call or let me know if you have any questions or uncertainty once the uh, exam opens up tomorrow afternoon. Take care.